Hey everybody, I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in one year. Today is day 202 of our one-year Bible reading plan. We're going to get into the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs, which is a great way to read the Bible. It lets you see wonderful connections, uniting the testimony of Jesus Christ that is written in the entirety of the book, Jesus said in Psalm 40 verse 8 and in Hebrews 10 7 prophetically telling us that there would be foreshadowings in the old covenant and fulfillments in the new covenant through Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, powerful way to read the Bible. Make sure you check out the resources I have linked below for continued study. Some are from the way of the worshiper.com, the devotional blog I do using my journalism master's degree to piece together things about the Bible and draw new connections and uncover and dig up truths that sometimes are concealed when we just kind of blaze through reading or go through the routines. I like to pick into God's word on a deeper level just for myself. I'm just a sister in Christ reading the Bible through in a year and studying to show myself approved in my personal life. But also I put it online because I'm just a regular person, and I think that you probably will find something in there as well as we together unite our faith and look into God's word to grow strong in Christ and our faith and our knowledge and understanding and application of God's word to our lives and to the world around us. So check those out. I have reflection questions below as well if you want to print those out. Use them in a Bible study. Use them in your personal devotion. There's all kinds of things I link below because I know that probably like me, there are things that sometimes it feels hard to dig into God's word. You don't know where to dig. Let me help you do something like that. I have skill in that area and I love sharing it with you. So make sure that you hit the thumbs up button to start today's reading or to end it when you're done to check it off. Log it into your YouTube library. It's a great way for you and I also to partner together, advancing the gospel online through gospel channels like this putting God's word, shining that light into the dark spaces. Leave a comment if something ministers to you someday. Somebody somewhere is going to come and look at reading the Bible through in a year through the way of the Worshipper YouTube channel. They're going to read your comment. If you have something encouraging or exhortative or scriptural, you'd like to add below to just speak to somebody somewhere in the future. Go ahead and pop that below. That's another great way you and I can partner together in this ministry. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. We anticipate your movement today, Holy Spirit. We invite your movement into our lives today in this moment. We cast aside every weight and sin that would beset us and try to block our understanding and perception. Father, we want to see life like you see it. We want to understand things through the understanding of the Holy Spirit. Father, you have the words to life and all wisdom belongs to you. Father, help us today as we proceed forward. We want to know you more. We love you, Lord. We worship and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today we're starting a new book of the Bible in the Old Testament. We're starting in the book of Second Chronicles. We just finished First Chronicles, had a lot of very choppy names in there, but very interesting because I was actually going back over the last few days and looking at first and second Kings and first and second Samuel. And I was kind of comparing them to some things I'd underlined and noted for myself in first Chronicles. And I thought, oh, there's an interesting nugget I didn't see before. So the first Chronicles, you kind of have to pick through it, but there was a lot in there actually that gives expanded information about stories that we've read from David's life and Solomon's life and the different Kings. And it's the same thing in Chronicles. So Chron second Chronicles is going to chronicle a lot of the events that we've already covered, but it's going to add new information and it's going to end as the books of the Kings did where Babylon has come in and they're going to sack Jerusalem. So the, my Bible here, I'm reading from the modern English version. It says that the second book of Chronicles is a continuation of the historical narrative of first Chronicles, which ended with the death of David. Yesterday's reading was the death of David and him setting up the kingdom for his son Solomon, who repeatedly is noted, by the way, especially in the books of the Kings and in First Chronicles, that it was the Lord who chose Solomon. I thought that was very interesting because the natural line of succession, remember, David had older sons. He had Adonijah and he had Absalom. Solomon killed Adonijah. I was reading that this morning when I was just kind of looking through things in my own time with the Lord. And so it was the Lord who chose Solomon, not David. And 
that was something that was important because the line of succession, there was a natural line, but God had a different plan. And just like he plucked David from obscurity, he plucked Solomon out of an affair that David had with Bathsheba. So anyway, now here we are. It's a continuation of the historical narratives of First Chronicles Jewish tradition attributes the books of the Chronicles to Ezra, who was, we know later from the book of Ezra, he was a scribe. Scribes and historians were important people. They were like early journalists, which is why I love how they piece together information. I can see journalism techniques applied to the way that Chronicles are, the books of the Chronicles are laid out. That, that says something to me as a writer. And I can see there that they took great pains for details. Well, you want that if you're a historian or somebody who is chronicling the actions and histories of the kings, especially because a lot of other cultures at this time were not, they were uh, narrative cultures. And so they passed down narratives from generation to generation. And it was important to write them down because in some cases, this is the only, these are, the Bible is the only record we have of other nations that existed at that time. So anyway, it was attributed to Ezra according to Jewish tradition. Its theme is Judah's greatness and an emphasis on the Davidic lineage and temple worship. We're going to cover several reformations and extended revivals. And we're also going to trace, trace some of the lineages of different kings that we saw in first and second Kings including Hezekiah and King Josiah. The building and dedication of the temple will be told in detail. This is essentially an evaluation of the nation's religious history. Okay, and then we catch all that up. We were just looking the other day at the Temple Guard. Now, you might just kind of gloss over. It was a really long list of names. But one of the backstory nuggets that's buried inside of there is that it was the Temple Guard who came for Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah in the Garden of Gethsemane and put him on trial. And so what I thought was so interesting is that's where in, in the days of David, Jesus's forefather that's when the temple guard was instituted and many gener how could he know 14 generations later they would come for the son of god the son of david wow okay so we're going to start we're going to read today second chronicles 1 2 and 3 now solomon the son of david strengthened himself over his kingdom and the lord his God was with him and made Solomon exceedingly great. And Solomon spoke to all of Israel, to the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and to the judges, and to all the leaders in all Israel, and the heads of their father's houses. Then they all went, Solomon and all the assembly that was with him, to the high place that was at Gibeon, because the tent of the meeting with God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness, was there." However, David had brought up the ark from Kiriath Jerim to the place he had prepared, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem, and the bronze altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made was set before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly sought it out to seek the Lord. And Solomon went up to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was before the tent of meeting, and he offered up a thousand burnt offerings on it. That night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I might give to you. Then Solomon said to God, you have given a great mercy to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, may your word to David, my father, be confirmed for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Now give wisdom and knowledge to me so that I might know how to go before this people for who can judge this great people of yours. Then God responded to Solomon, because this was in your heart and you did not ask for possessions, wealth and honor, or even the life of those who hate you, nor have you asked me for many days of life. But you have asked me for wisdom and knowledge that you might govern my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are now given to you. Possessions, wealth, and honor I will also give to you, such as has not been given to kings before you, nor those who will follow after you. So Solomon came from the high place at Gibeon before the tent of meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. Solomon gathered together chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, and he put them in designated cities with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold in Jerusalem 
as abundant as stones and cedar, as plentiful as sycamore trees in the lowlands of Shephelah. The horses of Solomon were imported from Egypt and Kuwait, and the traders of the king would take them from Kuwait for a price. They imported chariots from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150 pieces. And they imported from these places to all the kings of the Hittites and the Arameans. Now we're in Second Chronicles chapter 2. Now, Solomon wanted to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal house for his kingship. And Solomon designated 70,000 men to carry materials, 80,000 men to cut stone in the hills, and 3,600 supervisors to oversee these men. Solomon sent word to Hiram, king of Tyre, saying, As you did for David my father, and sent him cedar trees in order to build for himself a house in which to dwell, so deal with me. I am going to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, sanctified for him, for making sacrifices before him, and for incense of fragrant spices, and for the continual showbread, for burnt offering on both the morning and the evening, and Sabbaths, new moons, and appointed feasts of the Lord our God, as an ordinance forever for Israel. And the house that I am building will be great, because our God is greater than all other gods. But who is able to build a house for him, since the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain him? Who am I that I build a house for him, except to make offerings before him? Now may you send me a wise man who works with gold, silver, bronze, iron, and purple, crimson, and violet threads, and knows how to engrave, who will be with the skilled workers and me in Judah and Jerusalem, which David my father established. And may you send me trees of cedar, cypress, Al and algum from Lebanon, because I realize that your slaves know how to cut timber in Lebanon, and my servants will be alongside your servants to prepare an abundance of timber for me, because the temple that I will build will be great and marvelous. I will provide for the woodsmen, your servants who cut the timber, 20,000 dry cores of crushed wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 liquid baths of wine, and 20,000 liquid baths of oil. Then Hiram King of Tyre responded in a letter that he sent to Solomon. Because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. And Hiram said, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, who has made heaven and earth, and has king, given King David a wise son, having insight and understanding, who is building a temple for the Lord and a royal house for his kingship. And now I have sent skilled men endowed with understanding, Horam Abai, the son of a woman from the daughters of Dan, and the son of a man of Tyre, who knows gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, wood, and purple, violet, blue, and crimson threads, who knows how to make all types of engravings and to to devise every type of design that is given to him with your skilled men and the skilled men of my Lord David, your father. Now the wheat, the barley, the oil, and the wine that my Lord has declared, may he send these items to his slaves. And let us cut timber from Lebanon, whatever you need, and we'll bring it to you on rafts on the Sea of Joppa, and you will bring it up to Jerusalem." Then Solomon numbered all the male foreigners who were in the land of Israel after the census that David his father had taken. There were found 153,600, and he made 70,000 of them to carry materials, 80,000 to cut stone in the hills, and 3,600 supervisors to make the people work. Now we're in Second Chronicles chapter 3. So Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where he appeared to David his father, at the place that David established on the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. He began to build in the second month on the second day during the fourth year of his reign. These are the foundation measurements that Solomon used for building the house of God. The cubit length in the former standard measure was 60 cubits and the width 20 cubits. The porch vestibule that was in front of the nave hall had its length, like the width of a house as 20 cubits, and its height was 120 cubits, and he overlaid the inside with pure gold. And he paneled the great house with cypress trees and then covered it with fine gold. Then he decorated it with palm trees and chain work, and he overlaid the house with precious stones for decoration, and the gold was from Parvaim, and he covered the house, its beams, thresholds, walls, and doors with gold, and he engraved 
cherubim on the walls. Then he made the dwelling of the most holy place. Its length was as wide as 20 cubits and its width also 20 cubits. And he covered it with fine gold, 600 talents worth. And the weight in gold for the nails was 50 shekels. And he covered the upper chamber in gold. Then in the dwelling of the most high place, he made two cherubim that were cast metal and overlaid them with gold. And the wings of the cherubim were the length of 20 cubits. The wing of one cherub was five cubits reaching the wall of the house. And the wing of the other was five cubits reaching to the wing of the other cherub. And the wing of this cherub was five cubits reaching to the other wall of the house. And the other wing was five cubits touching the first wing of the first cherub. So the wings of these cherubim spread out were 20 cubits cubits. They were upright on their feet, facing inward toward the house. Then he made a curtain of violet, purple, crimson, and blue thread, and he wove cherubim into it. And he made two pillars in front of the house, 35 cubits high, with a five cubit capital on the top of the pillar. Then he made ornamental chain work, like in the most holy place, and set it on top of the pillars. Then he designed a hundred pomegranates and set them on the chain work. Then He raised the pillars in front of the temple with one on the right to the south and the other on the left to the north and the pillar to the south. He called Jachin and the pillar to the north. He called Boaz. That's the end of our reading in the Old Testament. One of the things I liked in yesterday's reading when David was talking about it was David who made all these designs and Solomon was implementing orders that David had taken great lengths to lay out for his son Solomon. One of the things that I loved is David said in 1 Chronicles 28, the Lord made me understand in writing all of this by his hand upon me and all the works of this pattern. So everything that we're reading, all these little details we're reading over here in Second Chronicles, David said it was the Lord who gave me these plans and writing through my hands. God cares about the details. I mean, look at, we're talking about hundreds of little pomegranates all the way down to the type of thread, the type of trees, the gold, all this wasn't out of Solomon's mind. This was out of David's mind and the Lord had given it directly to David. So the next time you wonder, does God care about the little details? Does he care about where I move? Does he care about what job I take? Does he care about the little details that matter to me, the choices that I have to make? He does care. And if it's something that is part of his plan and you need to know about it, you can seek the Lord. And he said through David to Solomon, if you seek the Lord, you will find him. Yes. And amen. Okay. Let's go over and read in the new Testament. Reading today, Romans chapter six. When we last left off, we were talking about the first Adam and the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. And Paul was saying that through the first man, sin entered the world because all have sinned. We would all make the choice that Adam did and because of our fleshly nature. We would all choose to sin. And because of the second man, who was the firstborn from the dead, Jesus Christ. We can have life through him. That's where we last left off yesterday talking in Romans 5. And the day before that, one of my favorite things is Romans 5, 5. And hope does not disappoint keeping the hope alive in the Lord. And the gift that we have of righteousness is through the life of one man, Jesus Christ. So now Paul is talking about when the law entered the world, we know we've read the books of the law. Now we've read uh, Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We've read the books of the law where God established the law after bringing his people through the great Exodus out of Egypt. He established the law not to be a big boss man in the sky, but to create a separateness between the disgusting filth and wickedness of the world and a people God loved because of Abraham, whom we just read about in Romans 4, because of Abraham, who his faith in the Lord was accounted to him as righteousness because he kept his eye on the one who was invisible. He hoped against hope in the Lord. And so through that, the law entered because of God's love for Abraham and the people that came out of him. Paul wrote that he didn't even notice that his body was really old, a hundred years old. He didn't notice his wife's body was old. He believed in the Lord. In fact, I'm just going to read real quick just to encourage you today. Romans 4, 20 and 21, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Take that to the bank, get it into the presence of God and stand upon that word. That's what Abraham did. So now the law came through 
because people had to understand what it looked like to be separate. That's what the law was. It was to teach people what sin looked like. This is sin. Don't do that. Here's the blessing of God that comes through obedience, separateness, holiness, cleanliness. But yesterday, what we read was the law entered so that sin might increase. So what happened was it drew such a dividing line between holiness and sin that people now had a choice they didn't understand before. Now they did. And sin increased because of the law. Now we realize, oh, we have a choice. And guess what? Just like Adam did, people chose to sin. That's what Paul is talking about to the Jews. This is who the book of Romans is written to, the Jews living in Rome. Sin reigned in death, but I love this. Sin increased and grace abounded much more. We see that over and over throughout all these Old Testament mistakes that we're reading that people make. God's grace and his mercy continues to abound through the hand that carries out his own plans. So now we're picking that up. That's right where we left it off yesterday and we're going to read today. Paul is continuing on in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Should we continue in sin? so that grace might increase? God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that we who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were baptized with him by baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, so shall we also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we should no longer be slaves to sin. But the one who has died is free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death has no further dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your bodies to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thanks be to God, for you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart, that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And having been freed from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, but just as you have yielded your members as slaves to impurity and iniquity, leading to more iniquity, even so now yield your members as slaves to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what fruit did you have then from the things of which you are now ashamed? The result of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and having become slaves of God, you have fruit unto holiness and the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes, and amen. That is the end of our New Testament reading. Oh my goodness. This is not a Bible study. I will not let myself continue forward, but this is a powerful reading to understand why, what we become slaves to. And Paul is saying, yield yourself and become a slave to God because you can trust the Lord. You cannot trust sin. The wages of sin are death every single time. But 
you are a slave to whatever it is you obey. So if you obey God, you are a slave to righteousness. If you're going to be enslaved by something, let it be to righteousness and to the obedience of the Lord. We can trust the Lord, his path and his plan. That hope does not disappoint. Okay, let's go over and finish up with a psalm and a proverb. Reading today, Psalm 16, 1 through 11. I love Psalm 16. We, this is our second time reading it this year. We'll have finished the Psalms and the Proverbs twice by the end of the year. What a substantial and amazing thing you will have accomplished if you are sticking with this 365 days in God's word. Psalm 16, 11 is an anchor scripture for the way of the worshiper. The, when, it's, when I talk about the three steps that show what the purpose of praise is. Step one is Psalm 22, three, which is the Lord dwells in the praises of his people. That is the Hebrew word for praise to Hila. Step two is Psalm 16, 11. We'll get there. And then I'll tell you about step three. So let's read Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you, I take refuge. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My welfare has no existence outside of you. For the holy ones who are in the land, they are the majestic ones, in them is all my delight. Those who chase after other gods, their sorrows will be multiplied. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor lift their names on my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Yes, an inheritance is beautiful for me. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My affections also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in security. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you suffer your godly one to see corruption. You will make known to me the path of life, for in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611 is step two of the way of the worshiper. So step one, the Lord dwells within the praises of his people. That's where we begin our understanding. Step two, in his presence is fullness of joy. Then step three is Nehemiah 810, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Those are the those are the foundation stones on the path that I pave on the way of the worshiper, the presence of God. And in the presence in his presence is that joy. It's unspeakable. It's full of glory. It's something the mind cannot comprehend. And that joy, that everlasting spring, that well, that is your strength. Of course, the enemy wants to get you out of the presence of God. He wants you to turn your back on God. This is why we turn our face to God. This is how believers get strong. And David is writing here about the blessing of the Levitical priesthood. Do you remember the, the Levites were given no inheritance in amongst the people and the 12 tribes were allotted all their lands? The Levites weren't given any. Actually, they were given a little bit from each tribe. So God didn't give them one geographical area. They had little portions in each allotment of land. That's how it works. When David said here, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup, he was speaking, even though he himself was not of the tribe of Levi, he was the tribe of Judah. He was speaking as a Levite. It's a prophetic statement about you and me as kings and priests, according to 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people set forth for the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. That's what David is saying here. When he's saying the Lord is the portion of my inheritance, my cup, you support my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places and there's an inheritance that's beautiful for me. He's speaking prophetically as a king and priest, according to the tribe of Levi, where the Lord said, I will be your portion of your inheritance, your lot. I will, the lines will fall for you in pleasant places. That's your promise as a king and a priest to the Lord. You have that Levitical anointing upon you through the new covenant. The Way of the Worshipper, the book that I wrote, Connecting with the Spirit of God Through Restoring Intimacy, Purpose, and Understanding, has a lot more on what it looks like to live like a Levite. That's a promise to you. There is a responsibility there that under the Levitical blessing that God has given you. But this is a promise. Check it out for yourself today. Psalm 16. Take a look. What a powerful reading. Okay, let's finish up with the proverb. Reading today, Proverbs 19, verses 20 and 21. Hear counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord 
will stand. Whew, that's a powerful one. Think about that today when you're going about your day. Uh, and the other versions say, man makes his plans in his heart, but the purposes of the Lord will prevail. The Lord perfects that which concerns you. The Lord fulfills his own words. The Bible is replete for that. That is filled with scriptural and spiritual agreement. Take a look today. You don't have to worry when you put your trust and your hope in the Lord. Okay. That's the end of our reading today. Day 202, reading God's word over the course of one year of our lives. I'm so glad that you've joined me. Hit the thumbs up button right underneath this video to track your own progress. Thank you for partnering with this ministry as well. Leaving a comment, hitting that thumbs up, subscribing to the channel. Check out the resources I have linked below for continued study in God's holy word. 365 days of God's word. No way you'll ever be the same again. I won't either. That's the whole point. I am Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Thank you for joining me today. Let's close real quick with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the reading of your word. We apply our faith to your word. You are a man of your word. You said it. You watch over it to see it performed. It is quick, living, active, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, we safely put our trust and our hope in you. We understand, Lord, that we make our plans, but we want your purposes to prevail. That's why we invite you here to this place. Father, come and have your way through your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we lift our hands to you and praise you, Lord. We bless the Lord at all times. May your praise continually be in our mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.